The nighttime collision between Cutter Blackthorn and the much larger tank ship Capricorn was violent and substantial, yet one that left both vessels still safely afloat, with little to no water flooding either ship's compartments. But on that fateful evening of January 28, 1980, coincidentally, the night of the U.S. Coast Guard's 65th anniversary, immediately after the collision, Blackthorn was performing initial damage assessments, holding an only five-degree list to port, and radioing their emergency to Coast Guard Sector St. Petersburg in Tampa Bay, Florida, when, as if being suddenly ripped open and pulled down by some massive claw from the deep, the vessel was instantly rolling over and going under faster than anyone on board thought possible. The crew, still left struggling inside, were in total darkness. From the U.S. Coast Guard, a cutter is basically any Coast Guard vessel 65 feet in length or greater, having adequate accommodations for crew to live on board. Built by Marine Iron and Shipbuilding out of Duluth, Minnesota in 1943, the U.S. CGC, or Coast Guard Cutter Blackthorn, was one of many buoy tending cutters with the mission to install and service ATONs, or Federal Aids to Navigation, throughout inland and coastal waterways. Just prior, by 1942, the Coast Guard began classifying cutters with a W at the start of their prefix, and Blackthorn's original designation would be WAGL-391, a Navy designation at the time meaning Auxiliary Vessel Lighthouse Tender. From the smallest 65-foot inland tenders and river tugs to the mightiest 400-foot and 420-foot Polar and Healy-class icebreakers, cutters are the backbone of Coast Guard operations. The black hull with red racing stripe and white superstructure is perhaps the most iconic and classic cutter image, a close second in my mind being the high endurance 378-foot Hamilton class. Buoy tenders, though, as the name suggests, are given the much less glamorous, yet no less important task of servicing navigation aids throughout U.S. waters and occasional icebreaking. Certainly capable of patrol and search and rescue, if necessary, but arguably not in the public eye as often as those high endurance cutters with their helipads and frequent involvement in high profile security and rescue operations. Commissioned in March of 1944, the Iris class 180 foot Blackthorn had a width of 37 feet and a draft of 12 feet and displacement of 984 tons. 391 began initially as a Great Lakes icebreaker in its first few months of service. By mid-1944, the vessel was then reassigned to San Pedro, California. And if you're curious like me, this repositioning journey was accomplished by exiting the Great Lakes via the St. Lawrence River, turning south toward the Panama Canal, and then turning north up the coasts of Central America and Mexico toward Station San Pedro. In early 1950, Blackthorn was reassigned to Mobile, Alabama, which meant another trip back through the Panama Canal to the Gulf Coast. Over the years, in addition to its primary mission of servicing navigation aids, the vessel had participated in many high-profile incidents like searching for survivors after the SO Greensboro had collided with the SO Suez in 1951, assisting in the search after a B-17 crash in 53, helping to search for survivors and then recover the wreckage after the tragic crash of National Airlines Flight 470, also in 1953, rendering assistance to sister ship Iris after the vessel beached itself due to hull damage in 57, and multiple other incidents assisting merchant mariners in distress from various vessels throughout the 50s, the Ocean Pride, Carrie Mack, Mission Carmel, Beatrice, and Miss Kane, to name a few. The Blackthorns designation changing in 1965 to WLB, or Seagoing Buoy Tender. The vessel would receive its iconic racing stripe paintwork in 1967, when the practice was adopted fleet-wide. The Blackthorns class being so prolific that these Coast Guard workhorses were known by those involved as simply the 180s. And in 1976, Blackthorn would be reassigned to Galveston, Texas, performing its mission along the Louisiana and Texas Gulf Coast. Built by Alabama Dry Dock and Shipbuilding out of Mobile, the oil tanker Capricorn started its life as the Powder River at about 523 feet long and 68 feet wide, 
referred to as a standard T2 tanker in size and configuration, with a two-house superstructure, the aft house containing engineering and the bridge actually amidships, common in the time period. Tankers also sometimes referred to as bunkers or bunker ships. Laid down and launched in 1943, the vessel was one of hundreds commissioned by the United States War Shipping Administration. Hastily manufactured and pressed into service to haul fuel oils, diesel, or crude oil, whatever the Allies needed most at the height of World War II. Like so many other War Department ships, Powder River was among the glut of vessels then sold off to the private sector once the war came to a close purchased by independent tank ships out of Wilmington, Delaware in 1948, then changing hands to Hess Tank Ships Company in 1955, when the name was changed to Hess Bunker, also based in Delaware. The most significant refit and modification came in 1961, when the vessel was, quote, jumboized. The refit jumboized T2 meant the tank ship's overall length was now 605 feet, 80 plus feet longer than original, and over three times the length of Cutter Blackthorn. The bridge relocated from its original midship location to the aft house, a more common configuration seen in modern bulkers and tankers. The bridge now 465 feet from the bow, and while it did have a raised focusal deck, there was a solid raised bulwark around the bow periphery. With a draft depth of 31 and a half feet, the tanker's deadweight tonnage would go from roughly 16,600 to 23,300. In 1977, S. Bunker was purchased by Kingston Shipping out of New York, where the name was then changed to Capricorn. Operated by Apex Marine Corporation in January of 1980, the Capricorn had a complement of nine officers, 22 deckhands, and one passenger. Of note were the captain, or master, a graduate from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy some 12 years prior, who'd worked his way up as officer on tank ships as large or larger than Capricorn throughout his career, becoming Capricorn's master in January 1978. The first mate, who'd served as officer on various tank ships since the mid-1940s, he'd reported on board Capricorn in June 1979. The second mate, who'd just graduated SUNY Maritime in 77, came aboard Capricorn in November of 79, and the third mate graduated SUNY in 79, joining the Capricorn that same year. Coast Guard vessels like Blackthorn traditionally have very long lifespans and careers, and thus need the occasional overhaul, refit, and or upgrade to remain viable. The onboard commanders of these vessels are also given quite a lot of latitude. So, in 1979, when the Blackthorn came due for a complete overhaul, the crew was insistent their vessel be hauled out and serviced at what was, in their eyes, the best yard for this, Gulf Tampa Dry Dock Company in the port of Tampa Bay. After all, the vessel had served for about 35 years by that point, was getting tired, and had seen much wear and tear. So the upcoming overhaul was expected to be comprehensive, months long in fact. The cutter reached the port of Tampa Bay in October of 1979, when this painstaking process began. The Blackthorn was serving with a complement of six commissioned officers and 44 crew. Commanding officer at the time was Lieutenant Commander Seeple, a near 10-plus year Coast Guard veteran. Aside from five years of shoreside duties, he'd served 16 months commanding a 95-foot patrol boat, two-plus years as second-in-command or executive officer aboard another 180 tender similar to Blackthorn, and another 16 months as an officer on deck aboard two different high-endurance cutters. Coming aboard Blackthorn as commanding officer in July of 1979, just a few months prior to the Tampa Bay refit. Blackthorn's second-in-command, the executive officer or XO, Lieutenant Crawford, a six-plus year Coast Guard veteran, had served two years as a watchstander and navigator aboard another 180, his only officer on deck experience prior to reporting aboard the Blackthorn in January of 1978. The underway officer on deck, or OOD, also serving as watchstander on the bridge was Ensign Ryan, again, fresh out of Coast Guard Academy, reporting aboard in June of 79, his first seagoing assignment as well. The remaining 46 crew on board ranged from ages 18 to 40, 
just over half with more than a year of seafaring experience. According to the NTSB, none of the deck officers on board Blackthorn had previously transited Tampa Bay before the inbound voyage to Gulf Tampa Dry Dock on October 15, 1979. The entire crew of 50 sailors would be put up in local hotels as the coming overhaul meant Blackthorn would be inaccessible, leaving the crew idle for an untold number of months. Tampa Bay, one of the busiest ports in the U.S., is widely known in the maritime world for its challenging ship channels. Most bays and harbors have channels that are just wide enough for a two-ship encounter, one inbound, one outbound, and sometimes not wide enough for both. Many harbors will coordinate ship traffic so that all deep draft ships are aware of one another, or so that two ship encounters, one inbound, one outbound, only occur at the widest points, and so on. Ship channels are dredged, dug out from the seabed and maintained at a deeper floor than the rest of the harbor, allowing a path for large ships to go directly from Anchorage, outside the bay, to their destination port, or vice versa. With the risk of ground strike always present, should any deep draft ship stray from the relative safety of the channel. This almost always requires local pilots to come aboard, take the con, and aid the bridge crew in navigating very specific routes the pilot has experience with. Many ships that dock in a harbor with complex channels don't have crews with the same level of local experience. Even those that frequent the area will oftentimes still hire pilots. This applies to all ships with a deep enough draft to require use of the channel cruise ships, cargo ships, even military vessels. And in Tampa Bay, even if a vessel doesn't draft enough to fully require the channel's depth, ships the size of Blackthorn still need to utilize the Cut A channel at the bay's entrance to pass underneath one of Tampa and St. Petersburg's most iconic features, a miles-long shipping obstruction spanning the width of the lower bay's entrance, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Ship channels can be challenging enough, especially those with several bends, some of which nearing 90 degrees. But the Skyway Bridge, the version in the time period, created a narrow point, 400 feet wide, down from a chart at 600 feet width for the remainder of the channel, preceded by two bends on either side, intersecting waterways just on the exit side, and is located nearer to the mouth of Tampa Bay, some 20 miles southwest from the relative safety of Hillsborough Bay, for example, leaving the entrance much more exposed and susceptible to challenging sea states and weather conditions. You might remember the Sunshine Skyway Bridge from my previous video, when the bulk cargo ship Summit Venture slammed into its support columns at night, completely destroying the highest points of the southbound spans. Even in the time period, bringing on pilots was mandatory for all large foreign vessels and for all U.S. vessels under registry in foreign trade. While it wasn't required for U.S. government ships, Tampa Bay pilot testimony stated that, quote, all U.S. Navy vessels transiting Tampa Bay do carry a Tampa Bay pilot. According to the NTSB, after three and a half months, the Blackthorn not only received routine maintenance and refreshing, but had the main propulsion generators also overhauled, a large section of its port shell plating replaced, and a new closed sanitation system installed. Although, no improvements were made to any of the cutter's outdated survival systems, something that will play a crucial role later. The crew had returned to their ship, and extensive dock trials of all systems were performed by Sunday, January 27, with the only issue of note being they could not reach maximum operating speed with the new Westinghouse brand generators. On January 28th, from 12 noon to about 2 p.m., they'd conduct sea trials in the bay, to again test propulsion, confirming there was an issue. Determining that it couldn't be fixed while underway, they'd return to Gulf Tampa Dry Dock, where the problem was corrected by Westinghouse service personnel, and the commanding officer, or CO, ordered a 6 p.m. departure for that same day. During their month-long downtime, Blackthorn had presumably rotated out seven enlisted sailors, as seven new crew had come aboard, sailing for their first time, when the vessel would leave out on Monday, January 28th, still with the same complement of six officers and 44 crew. Interestingly, the crew's shore leave hadn't been spent entirely idle. Brought on board for the return trip home were a small car, lashed to the starboard side of the buoy deck 
presumably a crew member's personal vehicle. One refrigerator, a small wooden watchstander shack, five batteries, two drums, five motorcycles lashed to the aft deck, reportedly partially obstructing some of the walkways. An emergency life raft that had been accidentally triggered, so was kept inflated and lashed behind the deckhouse. And the cargo holds were empty other than the crew's luggage. To be clear, it's not that this cargo was heavy or causing instability, relative to the massive buoys cutters routinely carry. Just a very curious part of the story. And it's presumed the commanding officer allowed this since they'd be heading straight to their home port in Galveston, Texas. And during normal circumstances, these vessels commonly have a deck full of large, heavy buoys. But the decks were empty during their time at dry dock, so the space was available for all those large personal items, I guess. I really can't speak to whether this fell under Coast Guard regs or not. Blackthorne's commanding officer opted not to bring a Tampa Bay pilot on board, despite having the authority to do so, stating they'd been, quote, in and out of several strange ports with Blackthorne, and I felt our navigation team was sufficient to safely navigate the area. On deck were the commanding officer, or CO, executive officer, or XO, the navigator and assistant navigator, officer of the deck, or OOD, the radar operator, one helmsman, and two phone talkers, enlisted sailors who handle the relaying of orders over shipboard phones to various parts of the ship. The Capricorn, fully laden with 22,500 tons of number six fuel oil on board, was anchored about three and a half miles west-southwest of the Tampa Bay Sea Buoy. At about 6 p.m., the tanker's first mate confirmed the radar, navigation lights, steering gear, engine order telegraph, general alarm, VHF radio, and ship's whistle were all operational. The ship weighed their portside anchor and got underway toward the harbor by about 6.45 p.m., according to the Coast Guard, leaving the port anchor ready for letting go. With the brake still set and holding the anchor firmly, this means the devil's claw and riding pole, or chocks, are left released so that the anchor can be dropped more quickly should the vessel require it. The starboard anchor was left housed and was not ready for letting go. They'd pick up their Tampa Bay pilot while underway at roughly 7.11 p.m. Their pilot that night, an experienced member of the Tampa Bay Pilots Association, actually had two previous successful navigations piloting the Capricorn itself, one as recently as October 1979 familiar with the tank ship's maneuvering characteristics. On duty aboard Capricorn, in addition to the pilot now, were the master, first mate, and helmsman, with a deckhand posted on the bow as lookout. The seas were calm that evening, and weather was clear, with at least seven miles of visibility. There was a light breeze from the north, and the air temperature was about 61 degrees, water temperature 64. But with sunset time of 6.07 p.m., darkness was setting in, Blackthorn, having gotten underway about 6.04 p.m., would exit the shipbuilder's marina via the Sparkman Channel, traveling about seven or eight knots, with an estimated transit time of about two hours to exit Tampa Bay. Off-duty crew were getting settled for the evening, relaxing, watching TV, taking showers. The cutter made no attempts via radio to assess that night's traffic in Tampa Bay, nor did they announce their outbound presence to other vessels in the area. It wasn't exactly a requirement to do so, but is typical for larger vessels in a busy port like this. In addition to radio calls between vessels, for instances such as inbound-outbound encounters, giving way, or other relevant alerts to each other's presence, as the distance closes between vessels, it's then common to acknowledge one another's intentions via whistle signals. And a bit of an aside, it's referred to as the whistle officially in the maritime industry but this is usually accomplished with the loud horn blasts you may have heard ships use. A couple relevant examples here. Rules of the road for inland U.S. waters are well known. One short blast says, I intend to pass by you on my port side. Two short blasts say, I intend to pass by you on my starboard side. If the other boat agrees, acknowledgement is by sounding the same blast pattern in response. We're, we're really getting in the maritime weeds here, sorry. As Blackthorn approached Cut D, where Seddon and Sparkman channels meet, 
the much larger cruise ship Kazakhstan was also traveling south via the Seddon Channel. Blackthorn being smaller was obscured by the trees on the southern tip of Harbor Island. The pilot on Kazakhstan stated no whistle signals or radio communications were exchanged when suddenly, quote, the cutter shot out fairly close in front of the cruise ship as the two vessels approached Cut D Channel. The Tampa Bay pilot aboard Kazakhstan made calls on VHF Channel 13, the common channel for bridge-to-bridge -bridge navigation safety. It is common maritime knowledge for ships 65 feet or longer to maintain a listening watch on this channel in U.S. waters. I cannot emphasize this enough. The cruise ship pilot made calls prior to getting underway in the Seddon Channel, but the only response they received was from a tug called Dennis, about 2,500 yards down channel. He also stated that once they'd reached Cut D, transiting Hillsboro Bay, with the Blackthorn just ahead, the pilot tried to contact the cutter as the cruise ship was now only about 200 yards behind them and closing, but received no response. It appeared, at least to the cruise ship crew, that the cutter was traveling quite slowly. As the Blackthorn reached Cut C, the commanding officer ordered full speed ahead, about 12 knots, and was then relieved by the XO. The cutter began to pull away from the Kazakhstan, but the cruise ship had planned to transit these open portions of the bay at 14 knots, which they accelerated to soon after. Nearing the southern end of Cut Sea, Kazakhstan was again starting to overtake the Black Thorn. The cruise ship's pilot said he tried to call the cutter once again and still received no response. With no overtaking arrangement made, the Kazakhstan reduced speed to half a head, roughly nine knots. In the Gadsden Cut, it was the same routine. The cruise ship sped up, wanting to travel at about 14 knots, began to catch up with the cutter as the vessels turned into cut F, and again, Kazakhstan's pilot couldn't get a response from Blackthorn. As the two vessels entered cut F, the cruise ship was hailed by a tug called Pat B. Pat B was traveling in the opposite direction, hailing Kazakhstan to arrange a port-to-port -port encounter as the vessels met. This way, both vessels know which side of the channel they'll use to yield. Pat B also stated they'd been able to raise the approaching Blackthorn and that they also agreed to meet port to port, but when the time came, for whatever reason, the cutter remained in the center of the channel, forcing Pat B to suddenly move over farther to the right, the two vessels passing dangerously close, within 15 to 20 feet of one another. After this encounter, and by the time Blackthorn reached Cut D, Kazakhstan's pilot tried yet again to contact the cutter. Finally getting a response, the faster cruise ship requested to pass. The Blackthorn acknowledging and, their draft not nearly as deep as the cruise ship, exited the channel to allow the cruise ship to pass, re-entering after at the northern end of Cut B. Tanker Capricorn, with their pilot on board, was planning to transit the Egmont Channel, then Mullet Key Channel, on their path to Cut A. Cut A being the primary concern in Lower Tampa Bay, as it's the channel that passes under the Skyway Bridge. Prior to entering Egmont Key, Capricorn's master and pilot discussed upcoming traffic conditions in the bay. The pilot had assessed they'd be meeting cruise ship Kazakhstan and possibly one other outbound vessel called Brave Eagle. As they entered Egmont Channel, Capricorn announced their inbound presence to all vessels in the area via Securite call over VHF Channel 13. The pilot ordered full speed ahead, which meant roughly 12 knots for the tanker when fully laden. A portion of the tanker's crew was relieved at this time. A different helmsman took the wheel, the third mate relieved the first mate at the engine order telegraph, and the lookout on the bow was also relieved. According to the relief lookout, his instructions were, quote, to report any small craft in the vicinity, any unlit buoy, and any ships which may cause problems. And also told by the third mate, quote, not to report any well-lit ships, because we know of them and if the lookouts keep calling in every ship that we pass, they would be taking up too much of our time handling the vessel. Partway through Egmont Channel, Capricorn's pilot spotted a brightly lit vessel about seven to eight miles up the bay to the northeast. Based on their traffic assessment and its lighting configuration, he assumed this was the cruise ship Kazakhstan. About this same time, VHF Channel 13 came to life again with another security call, this time from a tugboat called Ocean Star outbound in the Mullet Key Channel. The two vessels agreed via radio on a port-to-port -port encounter as Ocean Star transited outbound, coming toward the tanker. 
Once the distance closed, Capricorn's pilot stated they exchanged a one-blast whistle signal to acknowledge one another. However, the tugboat's master stated this whistle exchange did not take place, but that they did pass port to port without incident. The Capricorn still traveling full ahead, or roughly 12 knots. Capricorn's pilot saw the Kazakhstan, the cruise ship recently having passed under the Skyway Bridge, now making its turn from Cut A to the Mullet Key Channel. Both pilots began making their arrangements over the radio to meet port to port as their distance closed. Port about four miles. Now in Cut B, with the Kazakhstan far ahead, Blackthorn's XO was relieved of the con at this time by the ensign, officer on deck. The commanding officer was still on the bridge though, sitting in a chair on the starboard wing. The XO returned to the bridge, but only to have a coffee break with the commander, bringing him a cup from below, the Blackthorn turning into the Cut A channel at this time. The commander walked over to the starboard wing and observed a shrimp boat briefly, a boat called the Bayou, which was following the cutter, and as he walked back toward the port wing, they were then passing under the skyway. Back on the port wing, the commander spotted buoy 1A, but saw no inbound ships. He then returned to the wheelhouse, at which time the XO asked the conning officer, the officer on deck, have you talked to that guy? Referring to the inbound tanker Capricorn, at which point the two vessels were less than a mile and a half apart, three minutes or less from an encounter. There was the possibility at specific points that both the Kazakhstan and Skyway bridge columns would have obscured the Capricorn from view in the darkness, but not for the entire duration through Cut A. Just moments prior, Blackthorn's navigator was busy using the farthest range light of Cut A, a buoy roughly four nautical miles away, to plot their current course outbound, presumably looking at charts to do so. The cutter's lookout, posted on the flying bridge, the small fully exposed deck above the wheelhouse, was busy looking aft, observing the shrimp boat, and hadn't noticed the inbound Capricorn until one of the bridge's enlisted phone talkers pointed out the tank ship's lights. The lookout above turned to observe the tanker, confirming the sighting, but the information did not get relayed to the conning officer, as the phone talker assumed he was already aware of the Capricorn's presence. So when the XO asked the officer on deck, have you talked to that guy? For whatever reason, this was what prompted the conning officer to finally set his own eyes on the rapidly approaching tank ship for the first time, immediately requesting the XO make radio contact with the Capricorn to arrange an encounter. The conning officer was having a difficult time getting a bearing on the tanker using the Blackthorn's equipment, using their gyro compass repeaters, going back and forth between the port then starboard wing. Finally getting the inbound ship's bearing, he came back into the wheelhouse, glanced at the cutter's radar, but didn't see the Capricorn on screen. He went out to try taking bearings again from the port side gyro compass when he heard a garbled transmission over the radio telephone. I just, just came out of Anchorage and I won't be in your way. Assuming this was a response to the XO contacting Capricorn, confirming a port to port meeting of the two vessels. The conning officer then ordered a slight right to begin turning into Mullet Key Channel. Just prior, the commander had also taken a look at the radar himself and saw a large contact. He looked forward and saw the stern of cruise ship Kazakhstan up ahead, thus assuming the cruise ship was the large radar contact, and went about instead studying the chart for lower Tampa Bay. This was when he heard the garbled transmission, and I won't be in your way. This prompted the commander to step out onto the port wing, overhearing the conning officer give that order for the slight right to 263 degrees, the turn into Mullet Key Channel. The commander finally saw the Capricorn for his first time, the vessels now less than 400 yards or 30 seconds apart. The commander suddenly intervened, come right some more, the helmsman acknowledging, the commander quickly following up, right full rudder, sound the collision alarm. Just a few minutes prior, back on board the Capricorn, the lookout on the bow had first sighted the Blackthorn just as it came out from under the Skyway Bridge but stated he did not report the sighting because it was a well-lit vessel in the channel and appeared to be approaching in a normal manner. With the tank ship and cruise ship Kazakhstan passing without incident, the tank ship's pilot was still engaged in lighthearted conversation over his handheld radio with his fellow pilot on Kazakhstan. 
Making his way to the starboard wing, Capricorn's pilot wanted to check Mullet Key's range lights when he noticed the lights of another outbound vessel in Cut A, already on their side of the bridge. The pilot immediately switched his handheld to channel 13 and attempted to contact the, unknown to them, outbound vessel, stating that at this point, the vessel was about 1,200 to 1,300 yards off their port bow by roughly 10 to 15 degrees. This would put them at less than two minutes apart. The pilot assumed a normal port-to-port -port meeting would occur and that the outbound vessel would turn into Mullet Key Channel before the Capricorn would have to begin its turn into Cut A, estimating the two would pass at the extreme eastern end of Mullet Key. The intersection of these two channels having been widened somewhat on the north side of the bend for these reasons. Capricorn's master had actually noticed the unknown outbound vessel a few moments earlier, just as the tank ship and cruise ship Kazakhstan had finished their encounter. Walking back into the wheelhouse, the master checked the radar and position of the outbound vessel, which was about two-thirds of the way down cut A from between the Skyway and buoys 1A and 2A. The master then heard the pilot attempt to contact the outbound vessel. They waited about 30 seconds with no response and tried again. Meanwhile, the oncoming vessel still hadn't changed course toward Moloki Channel. Trying to contact it again, Capricorn still received no response, but also maintained their speed at full ahead. After about 30 more seconds, the pilot and master became concerned that a critical situation was developing. Those in the tanker's wheelhouse soon realized that the oncoming vessel had instead began to cross Moloki's centerline, and if the smaller outbound vessel remained on that course, would soon be dead ahead of the Capricorn with the port-to-port -port encounter no longer possible, potentially crossing the bow of the tank ship and at best, barely avoiding collision while exiting the channel. While this was happening, tugboat Ocean Star addressed the outbound cruise ship Kazakhstan over channel 13, stating to the effect, it just came out of Anchorage and I won't be in your way. The message heard on the Blackthorns bridge as well. Capricorn's master walked over to the pilot, referring to the oncoming unknown vessel. He asked, What's that guy trying to prove? The outbound ship's behavior appearing to go from aloof and erratic to downright dangerous. The vessels were 400 yards, 30 seconds apart, when the pilot abruptly changed intentions, ordering a two-blast whistle signal and 10 degrees left rudder to try and initiate a starboard-to-starboard -starboard encounter, but still made no attempt to decrease speed. The situation was quickly worsening as the oncoming cutter didn't respond to the two blast signal and just seconds later the pilot ordered 20 degrees left rudder before the helmsman could even execute the 20 degree order the pilot had ordered hard left rudder and sounded the danger signal on capricorn's whistle an unmistakable five short blasts of the ship's horn capricorn's lookout on the bow could see though that the blackthorn was now 50 to 100 feet away close enough that he heard someone aboard the cutter yell hard right. A stop order was finally given by Capricorn's master, and the engine room executed the order immediately, about 5 to 10 seconds from collision. The Blackthorn, traveling at about 11 knots, the Capricorn, 14 knots, and with both vessels unknowingly turning toward collision, the relatively small cutter slammed into the massive tank ship's port bow. A full, head-on collision narrowly avoided but the impact still healed the Blackthorn 10 degrees to starboard. Immediately after impact, Capricorn's pilot ordered engines full astern. The engines were immediately set to full reverse, but the tanker was massive. It would take quite some time to bleed off that much forward momentum. Keeping the rudder at hard left intentionally now, the tanker's pilot sought to exit the channel as quickly as possible and ground the vessel. In the chaos, it had veered far off course, and with its momentum, was now at risk of colliding with the Skyway Bridge if they didn't get it stopped soon. Blackthorn's engines had been set to full reverse as well since moments prior to impact, and as the cutter was grinding along the tanker's port bow before the smaller ship's forward momentum ceased, Capricorn's port anchor was grinding along Blackthorn's port plating when it grabbed hold firmly and ripped into the cutter amidships, penetrating into the crew shower area becoming so firmly embedded in the Blackthorn's port side that, when the vessels finally separated, the anchor came along with the cutter, pulling it from its mounting and straining the anchor chain's brakes. The Capricorn was now turning even harder to port, pulling Blackthorn in reverse 
faster than the commander had ever seen, while both vessels remained afloat. Sparks, dust, and debris filled the air at the tanker's bow and forecastle as the anchor chain overpowered its brakes, now running freely, dumping loosely out the port opening, the slack running underneath the Blackthorn as it was no longer being pulled taut. The vessels were steadily drifting apart though, the cutter moving backwards somewhat, but the Capricorn was still increasing its distance from the Blackthorn. Not intentionally, of course, but this put the cutter off Capricorn's stern and slightly to port as their separation increased. On board the Blackthorn, the initial list during impact was, at most, about 15 degrees to starboard, but the anchor's weight brought it back to port, maintaining a roughly 5 degree list. Prepare for collision had been piped over the cutter's PA just prior, but the general quarters alarm, even afterwards, had still not been triggered and no further instructions were being given over the PA by this time. Roughly 20 off-duty crew members had gathered on the mess deck, located on the main deck, amidships on the starboard side. This included those brand new crew members fresh from boot sailing for their first time. Panic and confusion ensued on the mess deck. Some crew members went to check the station bill posted near the ship's office aft of the mess deck to check their collision at sea assignments. An experienced petty officer soon took charge and ordered those in and around the mess hall to execute condition zebra, meaning all appropriate doors, fittings, hatches, and in their situation, portholes as well, should be closed and dogged or made watertight to prevent any potential flooding. Another petty officer used the mess deck's telephone to check in with the bridge, but was told to stand by for instructions. A crewman who'd been in the shower at the time of the collision was found naked, injured, and in shock by two others in the main deck passageway just aft of the crew's shower. He was mumbling something about the anchor in the shower, and one of those who'd found him went forward to check and sure enough, he saw with his own eyes the 13,500 pound or nearly 7 ton anchor embedded in one of the bulkheads that doubled as the shower area's wall. Another sailor that had been out on the forecastle in impact was also being helped two crew bringing him to the mess deck, which was now doubling as a sort of de facto triage in the chaos. While this was happening, several engineering officers and machinery technicians were below decks checking the engine room, aft steering, and other lower compartments for water ingress, but they were dry and sealed off. The only water ingress had been through the portions ripped open near forward berthing, below the main deck, which may have allowed flooding to aft berthing as well but this was possibly sealed off already. Up above, two crewmen were trying desperately to free that inflated life raft from the railing behind the wheelhouse, but were unsuccessful. Very few crewmen were aware of life jacket locations, and even fewer knew how to actually launch the life rafts from their enclosures. Back on the Blackthorns Bridge, one of the quartermasters was directed to broadcast a mayday on VHF Distress Channel 16, while another located the inflatable life jackets for those on the bridge. The Blackthorn transmitted. Mayday, Mayday, Coast Guard, Group St. Petersburg. Group St. Petersburg, this is Cutter Blackthorn. Be advised we had a collision. A collision to the seaward side of the Skyway Bridge. Approximate position 1 Alpha, Bullet Key Channel, over. Group St. Pete responded. Cutter Blackthorn, Group St. Pete, Roger. Request to know if you're taking on water and how bad the damage is, over. Blackthorn followed up. This is Blackthorn, stand by, stand by this channel. Amidst the chaos and darkness, it's presumed the cutter's bridge crew was unaware of the unwelcome seven-ton passenger embedded in their port side. The commander and officer on deck were working to find the nearest shallow water area, and they decided on Mullet Key Shoal to the north. The commander brought the engines to a stop, preparing to engage them forward again to head. The vessels had drifted far enough apart that the anchor chain reached its length of 990 feet and suddenly tightened with a force of about 126 long tons. The chain ripped through some of Capricorn's shell plating as it wrenched Blackthorn over to its port side almost instantly, ripping open Blackthorn's bilge keel. As the vessel rolled, both the commander and officer on deck yelled, Abandon ship! But in the sudden, even more severe chaos, no one was able to get this message out over the Cutter's PA. From the U.S. Coast Guard, 
as Blackthorn began to capsize in the darkness, Seaman Apprentice William Flores and another crewman located the life jacket locker. They threw life jackets to crew members already in the water, and Flores used his trouser belt to hold open the locker door and allow more to float to the surface. After most of the survivors had abandoned ship, Flores stayed with the sinking tender, determined to save more shipmates trapped in the sinking hull. Another crewman had also valiantly attempted to cut one of the wooden life boats free as the vessel overturned, but the cutter was just rolling over too quickly. From the NTSB, as the cutter capsized, some crew members ran to the nearest hatch or door leading to the outside. The four men in the engine room remained at their station, and other crew members did not know what to do and remained on the mess deck. Some crew members on the bridge and focusal jumped overboard. In escaping, the forward door leading down to aft berthing was left open. About 15 crewmen were trapped on the mess deck when the cutter capsized. One crewman forced open the starboard watertight door at the forward end of the mess deck as the cutter rolled over, and he and two other crewmen quickly escaped. The rollover had taken roughly 15 to 20 seconds total, and the vessel's generators had cut out part way through. Primary lighting went out, and the independent emergency lanterns reportedly never kicked on either. The crew, still left struggling inside, were in total darkness. A few seconds later, when the cutter had completely capsized but was still afloat, while in or near the mess deck, another crewman found what would have been the escape hatch from the engine room that leads up into the mess deck when the ship's upright, but the ship was inverted, and this hatch was now overhead. He yelled, I found a way out! And yet another crewman tried to stop his shipmates from going through that hatch. He was successful in convincing two men that this was not an avenue for escape. The three crewmen attempted to swim out the starboard watertight door to safety, while the others climbed up into the engine room through that inverted hatch. Only one of the three crewmen who used the starboard door was successful in his efforts to escape the sinking hull. The Capricorn transmitted, This is Tanker Capricorn KIHX west of Skyway Bridge. Just had a collision with another vessel which appears to be sinking. Then another vessel, thought to be the shrimp boat Bayou, chimed in 30 seconds later. The vessel is sunk, requesting assistance on scene. Those Blackthorn sailors in the water grasped anything they could for flotation. Floating planks, rolled up inflatable life jackets, and, since all survival craft aboard Blackthorn had failed, it was that wooden watchstander's shack which had broken loose that provided the nearest, largest refuge for flotation. Some were still clinging to the cutter's upturned hull, others trying to swim away from it. A chief warrant officer began ordering those who could to gather around the floating wooden shack ordering the sailors clinging to the sinking hull into the water and to swim towards the group. One crewman found floating unconscious was hauled up onto the floating shack by two others as the group came together, providing mutual support to one another while they awaited rescue. Many simply used those rolled up life jackets because, at the time, the style of inflatable life preservers on board were found too difficult to fully deploy in an emergency. They were extremely cumbersome bound together tightly by several complex straps, but even in their pre-deployed form, still provided at least a bare minimum of life-saving flotation. Capricorn had started launching one of their lifeboats right away, but, like so many others in the time period, the launching process was overly complex, with its screw-type davits, and it was just an open wooden rowboat with no other form of propulsion. The men had difficulty in getting it launched and in maneuvering it to the scene. The Capricorn was exempted from having a proper motor lifeboat and gravity launching davits because its last major conversion was prior to May of 1965. The Blackthorn filled with water almost instantly once it was completely overturned, so it's important to note, this entire sequence, from collision to capsizing to completely underwater, was only about three and a half minutes long. Collision was roughly 8.21 p.m., and the transmission that followed, reporting the vessel had sunk, was about 8.24 p.m. Capricorn also reported their own vessel had grounded just one minute later. That shrimp trawler, though, the Bayou, that was following Blackthorn out of the bay, had rushed toward the chaos and was on scene within just a couple minutes. The three crewmen aboard the trawler were able to haul 23 sailors aboard right away, providing clothing, food, and warmth. 
Capricorn's lifeboat had actually taken quite some time to get underway. Not fully deployed until 8.45, about 24 minutes later, and then was having difficulty maneuvering toward the scene. Those survivors in the water later stating they never saw any lifeboats or life rafts. A 41-foot Coast Guard utility boat, CG41452, had been dispatched immediately from Sector St. Petersburg and was next to arrive after the bayou. Joining the search and rescue by 8.52 p.m., rescuing four more survivors and recovering one lifeless victim. Some of those rescued on the bayou went over to the patrol boat, one even jumping into the water to assist in getting their unconscious crewmen up on the 41-footer's deck, even attempting CPR until the patrol boat reached the shore of Moloki, where the men were turned over to emergency personnel waiting on the shoreline. With 28 Blackthorn crewmen accounted for that night, 22 remained missing. Capricorn's lifeboat remained on scene to continue searching for the next few hours, though, crewed by their second mate and six other sailors from the tanker, joined by four helicopters, two from Coast Guard Air Station Clearwater, one from the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department, and another from the Tampa Police. The Blackthorn lay at the bottom of the channel now, about 48 feet deep. The first divers on scene were scuba divers from the Eckerd College Search and Rescue Unit out of St. Petersburg, arriving about two hours after the sinking, stating they found no signs of survivors, but did not enter the vessel and were struggling with equipment problems, strong currents, and deteriorating conditions. Plus, entering such a tight, complex overhead environment with near zero visibility would be an extremely dangerous proposition. By roughly 4 a.m., the Coast Guard Inland Construction Tender USCGC Vice, with their hard hat divers, would assume command of all underwater operations and started searching more thoroughly. In addition, Cutter White Sumac, multiple Coast Guard auxiliary vessels, and two fixed-wing aircraft arrived on scene as well. The vice was positioned directly over the Blackthorn, which lay on its port side across the ship channel. According to the U.S. Coast Guard, on the third dive, the starboard side of the hull was tapped on from the outside. Debris could be heard randomly striking the hull from the inside of the vessel. As they dove again, on the 4th, 5th, and 6th dives, three victims were recovered, but no air pockets or survivors were found after a thorough search of all accessible interior spaces. Two more victims were found near the buoy deck and recovered later that morning by scuba divers from Pinellas Park Fire Department. The active, exhaustive search for survivors would continue for another full day, being terminated at 4.50 p.m. on Wednesday, January 30th. Three more deceased were located in the water within five miles of the scene on February 3rd, 5th, and 6th, with 14 of Blackthorn's crew still remaining unaccounted for. From the NTSB, on February 7th, a company hired by the Coast Guard conducted a side-scan sonar survey of Cut A Channel, west of the Skyway Bridge. This survey showed where the Capricorn grounded, its anchor chain, its anchor, and several debris fields. To raise the vessel as quickly as possible took a massive effort. Positioned above Blackthorn were two commercial heavy lift derrick barges, the 650 ton lift vessel Cappy Biso, and the 100 ton lift vessel Little David. Their combined efforts would have the cutter upright on the bottom by the 13th. Then the lifting effort spanned a full week, when the stricken cutter was finally above the waves by February 19th, dewatering taking about 10 hours after that. The remaining 14 victims were then located and recovered from interior spaces deemed inaccessible while underwater. A quartermaster was found in the chart room, and 13 sailors were found in the starboard side, upper level of the engine room. Death certificates list official cause is drowning for all 14. However, by the Coast Guard's own admission, 12 of the autopsy reports suggested evidence that instead increased the possibility of eventual suffocation. From the U.S. Coast Guard, in his selfless effort to save more lives, Flores sacrificed his own life, as if given the gift of life by Flores, another crewman later recounted. As I struggled, suddenly a life jacket from the locker that was on the main deck came floating up to me. In total, all 32 aboard the tank ship Capricorn 
reported either minor or no physical injuries. Of the 50 crew on board Cutter Blackthorn, 27 survivors reported minor or no physical injuries, and 23 souls were lost. After going hard aground, Capricorn also dropped the starboard anchor so that the vessel would hold its position safely during the aftermath. After a thorough inspection, no punctures were found and the tanker was deemed ready to be refloated. They would first cut the port anchor free from the focusal in fear that it might still be snagged in the Blackthorn and to not disturb the underwater debris field. At high tide, the Capricorn floated free about 7.20 p.m. Tuesday, January 29th and proceeded under its own power to Whedon Island Station to be offloaded. A five-month-long investigation followed, which ended up quite controversial as it saw the U.S. Coast Guard, a military agency, investigating itself in a high-profile incident where their own unit had high potential of being found at least partially responsible, which can create significant conflicts of interest for several reasons. It's not to say the Coast Guard didn't come down hard on their own. I found they very much did, in their report at least. But it simply cannot be overstated. This ordeal was a massive wake-up call, an extremely raw time emotionally for the U.S. Coast Guard, putting in the spotlight some very lax attitudes and practices towards safety and seafaring. It's especially crucial in times like these to have a civilian agency like the NTSB who can investigate as impartially as possible. The Safety Board finding many standard practices that the Coast Guard themselves hold merchant mariners to, for example, completely flouted by Blackthorn as the tension-filled investigation got underway. Stepping away for a moment, in describing the incident in this video, I personally had the luxury of getting the sequence of events from point A to point B without breaking stride. But at the time, as with many incidents like these, much of this information wasn't uncovered until investigators dug deep and parties involved finally spoke up, slowly piecing the puzzle together. And available, but not common, was the technology to allow BDRs, voyage data recorders, which were not available on the Blackthorn. For instance, it wasn't revealed until late 1980 when a court-martial was brought against Blackthorn's commanding officer that he, quote, opted not to bring on a Tampa Bay Channel pilot because he wasn't aware of how to do so. This was in addition to his original statement that they'd been in and out of several strange ports with Blackthorn, and I felt our navigation team was sufficient to safely navigate the area. When he finally confessed during the trial, it was reportedly through tears and much remorse. According to the U.S. Coast Guard, during proceedings, the three officers, the engineer and damage control officer, were unable to demonstrate basic theoretical knowledge of vessel stability. They also did not understand the information contained in the vessel stability book. Now, stability, or lack thereof, was not found at issue in this incident. But this lack of knowledge of coal regs, or Convention on the International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea, of inland water navigation and rules of the road, of basic seafaring, this was of great concern to investigators. From the NTSB, quote, During testimony, the commanding officer just prior to collision demonstrated a lack of understanding of the inland rules and pilot rules relative to whistle signals and of vessels meeting in a bend in a narrow channel. Meaning, if a vessel is operating in inland waters, which, by definition, upper and lower Tampa Bay do fall under and are not considered high seas, the rules state the following. Article 18, Rule 1. When steam vessels are approaching each other head-on, that is, end on or nearly so it shall be the duty of each other to pass on the port side of the other and either vessel shall give as a signal of her intention one short and distinct blast of her whistle which the other vessel shall answer promptly by a similar blast of her whistle and thereupon such vessels shall pass on the port side of each other but if the courses of such vessels are so far on the starboard of each other as not to be considered meeting head to head Either vessel shall immediately give two short and distinct blasts of her whistle, which the other vessel shall answer promptly by two similar blasts of her whistle, which, for whatever reason, Blackthorn completely neglected all or most of this based on these reports. It was also driven home by the NTSB that Blackthorn's fore and aft masthead lights were indeed a factor, 
which can create the illusion, from a third party's perspective, of a smaller vessel. By definition, from the coal regs, as of 1972 in this sighting. Rule 23. Horizontal positioning of masthead lights require, in part, that the horizontal distance between the forward and after masthead lights be not less than one half the length of the vessel. When a vessel is viewed from a distance, those trained can quickly ascertain its approximate size, for one, based on masthead lights if the angle is appropriate. However, if the light's separation appears to be similar to that of a much smaller vessel, well, but the practice was found to be common at the time on Coast Guard cutters of similar size because they were given an exemption. Quote, because of special construction, the following Coast Guard vessels cannot comply fully with this requirement and are exempted from compliance. This exhaustive list containing many cutters, including Blackthorn, whose lights were only separated by about 16 feet. The Blackthorn's unused life rafts were also tested and examined by investigators. Quote, the five life rafts on board the Blackthorn were recovered and examined by an expert on March 3, 1980. Two of the life rafts were Mark III life rafts manufactured in 1954 and 55 by United States Rubber Company. The expert stated that, because of the deterioration of the fabric due to age, these rafts should not have been placed on a ship for use as survival equipment. One raft had slashes in both inflation chambers, and the second raft had no CO2 inflation cylinders. Two rafts were Mark V rafts manufactured by Uniroyal in 68 and 70. Both rafts were recovered in their flexible rubber carrying cases. One of the rafts found on board the Blackthorn, after the cutter was raised, had a 4-inch cut in one of the inflation chambers and no CO2 inflation cylinders. The other raft, found on the bottom of Tampa Bay, inflated properly after being recovered and sent ashore. Another raft, also a Mark V, was found partially inflated on the surface of the water. Survivors testified that, as the cutter capsized, Blackthorn's lights went out. No emergency lighting came on, and about 15 crewmen were trapped on the mess deck. About nine of these crewmen became disoriented in the dark and climbed into the engine room. Those that were found once the cutter was raised. As a result of his investigation, the safety board urgently recommended that the U.S. Coast Guard provide automatic emergency lighting for egress from all manned spaces on all Coast Guard cutters. The sudden capsizing and sinking caused by the anchor were, of course, truly outside anyone's scope to have foreseen. But regarding the collision, the NTSB was critical of Capricorn's decision-making, but came down hardest on Blackthorne's officer corps, stating, quote, The safety board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the failure of the Blackthorn to keep on the proper side of the channel when meeting another vessel in a bend because the commanding officer failed to adequately supervise the actions of an inexperienced officer on deck. Contributing to the accident was the failure of the commanding officer of the Blackthorn and the pilot of Capricorn to establish a passing agreement using bridge-to-bridge -bridge radio telephone or whistle signals and the failure of the commanding officer to keep himself aware of all traffic in the channel. Contributing to the high loss of life was the sudden capsizing of Blackthorn due to the Capricorn's anchor getting caught in the cutter's shell plating. To expound on this a bit, a few of the high impact statements from the NTSB's conclusions. The Blackthorn, a relatively small, shallow draft maneuverable vessel, could have maneuvered at the edge of the channel or outside of the channel and kept out of the way of the Capricorn, a large deep draft, less maneuverable vessel, which was restricted to the channel. The CO was not aware of the inbound Capricorn until seconds before the collision, although he was on the Blackthorn's bridge and ultimately in charge of its navigation. The officer on deck should have verified that the XO had established an agreement. The pilot of the Capricorn should not have attempted to meet the Blackthorn without first establishing the same type of agreement via radio telephone or whistle signals. A one-blast signal sounded by the pilot of the Capricorn after his first radio attempt might have prompted the crew of the Blackthorn to take action to accomplish a safe port-to-port -port meeting. The collision may have been avoided if the pilot of the Capricorn had sounded the danger signal and slowed at any time between the two radio transmissions, or even promptly after the second transmission. The failure of the Blackthorn and Capricorn to make radio contact was probably due 
to interference from the Ocean Star radio, which was being operated on the high power setting on channel 13. The CEO's lack of recent seagoing experience and unfamiliarity with Tampa Bay made his decision to sail at night imprudent. Neither the CEO XO nor EO of the Blackthorn understood the fundamentals of ship stability or how to use the Blackthorn stability data. The officer on deck's knowledge of navigation and the rules of the road were not sufficient to enable him to navigate the Blackthorn in Tampa Bay without direct, competent supervision. The pilot of the Capricorn misinterpreted his responsibility under the inland rules of the road for initiating a one-blast signal when meeting an outbound vessel at the junction of Mullet Key and Cut A channels, his reasoning being he did not sound a one-blast signal because the two vessels were approaching each other obliquely and a one-blast signal would mean the Capricorn was going to maintain course and speed when, in fact, the Capricorn was going to turn left to remain in the channel. The officer on deck was not closely supervised while he was conning the Blackthorn in unfamiliar restricted waters at night. The Coast Guard system for selecting officers for assignment as commanding officer and for qualifying officers to take charge of deck watch was not adequate. The crew of the Blackthorn was not adequately trained in locating life jackets, using life rafts, and water survival techniques. The accident might have been avoided if a pilot had been employed aboard Blackthorn. If the Blackthorn had transmitted a secure take call before getting underway, or in cut A channel before passing under the Skyway Bridge, a passing agreement might have been established between the Capricorn and Blackthorn, and the collision might have been avoided. The commanding officers of Coast Guard cutters can improve the operational safety of all vessels in pilotage waters by informing local pilot associations of their movements and by broadcasting secure take calls when getting underway. Although in compliance with the inland rules of the road, this class of Coast Guard buoy tenders can be brought into closer compliance with the international regulations for horizontal spacing of masthead lights and should comply as closely as possible to the regulations. Rule 34 of the proposed unified rules for preventing collisions on inland waters should eliminate the confusion concerning whistle signals when vessels are meeting in the bend of a narrow channel. The intersection of four channels at Buoy 2A in Tampa Bay poses an unnecessary hazard to navigation. This accident may have been avoided if ships in Tampa Bay were prohibited from passing in bends. There is a need for a higher level of vessel traffic service in Tampa Bay. The Coast Guard's use of Mark III life rafts is unsafe and should be discontinued immediately. The location of life raft stowage on the Blackthorn did not render the life rafts ready for launching in an emergency. The hydrostatic releases for life rafts on Coast Guard buoy tenders are set at too great a depth for these vessels' normal areas of operation. The failure of the emergency lighting system hindered the escape of crewmen from the Blackthorn. The use of non-buoyant life raft containers on board the Blackthorn made one of the three usable life rafts ineffective. The lack of a motor lifeboat on the Capricorn greatly reduced its rescue capability. The utility of lifeboats on U.S. cargo ships is greatly reduced by the continued use of screw-type davits, which increases the time required to launch them in an emergency. The lack of automatic data recording devices on both vessels prevented an accurate reconstruction of their track lines. Now, keep in mind, when we do recommendations like these from incidents back this far, many have been acted upon, some made obsolete by advancements in technology and engineering, while others may be simply outdated for whatever reason. That being said, I personally still feel it's imperative we cover them, as it's crucial in understanding the lessons learned and steps we've taken, or can keep taking, as a society, to minimize loss of life at sea, or in the workplace. Like one of my favorite instructors used to say, you keep training the fundamentals, the basics, until you're tired of them, absolutely sick of them, and then you train them some more. From the NTSB, as a result of its investigation, the Safety Board reiterates the following recommendation to the U.S. Coast Guard, meaning they'd recommended this prior to the incident already. Require the installation of an automatic recording device to preserve vital navigational information aboard ocean-going tank ships and container ships. And these days, we all know how crucial those voyage data recorders or black boxes have been in modern times. In addition, 
the safety board recommended that the U.S. Coast Guard require all Coast Guard candidates for command or designation as qualified deck watch officer on Coast Guard cutters over 100 feet in length to pass an examination similar to that required for corresponding merchant mariner licenses and to be re-examined on a periodic basis, to take a course in basic ship stability and demonstrate their knowledge of the stability and loading data for the cutter to which assigned, to have a period of underway training before assuming command if they have been ashore for an extended period, require that the commanding officer of each Coast Guard cutter ensure that all personnel are aware of the location of all life-saving equipment such as life jackets and are aware of how life rafts are launched before getting underway, review current water survival training programs for Coast Guard personnel assigned to cutters, and increase the effectiveness of these programs. Require the commanding officers of Coast Guard cutters over 100 feet in length to employ pilots when the commanding officer is unfamiliar with pilotage waters, to conform to local practice regarding exchange of information with local pilot associations regarding their movements in pilotage waters, and broadcast secure take calls when getting underway to inform other vessels of their presence, unless such information would not be in the interest of national security. And emphasize the important obligation to sound whistle signals in accordance with the appropriate rules of the road. Modify the lights on Coast Guard buoy tenders to comply as closely as possible to the regulations by moving the forward masthead light as far forward as possible and rescind or modify the exemption for Coast Guard buoy tenders. Prohibit ships from meeting in bends in Tampa Bay. In conjunction with appropriate federal and state agencies, relocate the intersection of the intercoastal waterway and the Southwest Channel and the main shipping channel in Tampa Bay away from Buoy 2A. Reevaluate the proposed level of vessel traffic service or VTS in Tampa Bay and determine if a higher level of VTS is needed. Require all U.S. merchant vessels over 1,600 gross tons to be equipped with at least one motor lifeboat on each side and gravity davits throughout. Inventory the life rafts on all Coast Guard cutters and replace all Mark III life rafts with Coast Guard approved life rafts immediately. Conduct a one-time inspection of all Mark V life rafts on Coast Guard cutters and replace or repair them as necessary. Examine the stowage location of life rafts on all Coast Guard cutters and ensure that the location permits ready manual overboard launching. Require that the hydrostatic releases on buoy tenders and other Coast Guard cutters, which operate principally in coastal waters, be set between 5 and 15 feet, as required by Coast Guard regulation for merchant vessels. Provide all life rafts used on Coast Guard cutters with buoyant containers so that they will float to the surface if the cutter sinks. Examine the reliability of automatic emergency lighting aboard Coast Guard cutters and make necessary modifications. The trials for the Blackthorns commanding officer and officer on deck amounted to a general court-martial for the commander, but only an admiral's mast for the officer on deck. The court-martial could have resulted in two to eight years of hard labor and dishonorable discharge if found guilty, but the commanding officer was not convicted as a result. The commander receiving only a letter of admonition, the same outcome as the officer on deck, for not taking proper care in monitoring the movement of other ships and lax execution of their duties. The tank ship Capricorn did not continue on much longer, as it was sold to shipbreakers in Taiwan by September of 84, with work to scrap the Hulk beginning that same month. After the Blackthorn was raised, dewatered, and searched thoroughly for victims, by February 20th, the cutter was brought back to Gulf Dry Dock in Tampa where investigations continued. There was so much damage throughout that the U.S. Coast Guard placed Blackthorn in a decommissioned, inactive status, going into effect immediately. Eventually, Blackthorn WLB-391 was brought out to sea and sunk as an artificial reef in the Gulf of Mexico. Nowadays teeming with sea life, but still at least partially visible as of this writing. It's actually a popular dive site about 80 feet deep, and just 200 feet away from another similar-sized vessel, a tug called Sheridan. From the U.S. Coast Guard, in the years after Blackthorn's sinking, surviving crew members who witnessed Flores' bravery lobbied the service to recognize and honor their fallen shipmate.
Flores' shipmates gathered records and eyewitness accounts to ensure that he was duly recognized for his self-sacrifice and devotion to duty. In September 2000, William Flores' family accepted from the service the posthumous award of the Coast Guard Medal, the service's highest award for peacetime heroism. Twelve years later, the service honored him again with the commissioning of his namesake, Cutter William Flores, a 154-foot Sentinel-class fast response cutter home ported at Sector Miami. Flores was the one that stood out to me, but there were many heroes that day, and multiple memorials have since been commissioned, along with ceremonies held to honor them. By January of 1981, perhaps the most prominent one was founded, the Blackthorn Memorial, about two miles north of where the incident occurred, on the shore at the Skyway Bridge rest area off Interstate 275. A memorial buoy that stays lit at all times and plaque were dedicated in Coast Guard Sector Galveston, and an underwater memorial called the Circle of Heroes off the coast of Florida features a plaque and six-foot statue dedicated to the heroic 18-year-old William Flores and his shipmates. I put these case studies together with much diligence in fact-finding, information gathering, and then cross-referencing multiple reputable sources as I write the script. Being that well informed on these topics makes it possible for a genuine attempt at critical thinking on my part. Brick and Mortar partnered with Ground News for these same reasons. Ground News is a groundbreaking way to have a news feed free from algorithms and partisan bias, a way to see the factual rating of sources to see where their partisan bias might lie, and to cross-reference multiple sources and stay better informed. One easy way to support the channel is by checking out Ground News at ground.news slash brick and mortar. Videos of this scope take quite the amount of effort and time, so your patience is appreciated. This is one I'd been putting together behind the scenes slowly for the past couple years, so I knew it was gonna be massive. The larger projects like these are only possible because Brick and Mortar has so many wonderful supporters. Thank you, from the bottom of my heart. And a special shout out to those top tier supporters. Drayson, Robert G, P Rush, Paul Rohrbaugh, Nathan M, Melon Lord, Maximum Hats, Manuel M, Kenneth P, Christian T, Broken Spectrum, Andrew S, Andrew M, and Alex S. And don't forget, you're important and your safety matters.